is the prevalent Risk Governance Podcast, featuring conversations with today's top C-suite executives and practitioners who not only look at third-party risk governance, but push through the boundaries to protect data. Now, here's prevalent CEO, Jonathan Dembrot, and third-party evangelist, Brenda Ferraro. This week, Jonathan and I are extremely happy to welcome Steve Katz. He is the very first CISO back in 1995 and has such an enormous amount of wisdom and information for the podcast listeners today. We're going to be talking about what is the role of a CISO. We'll also hear about what do you need to do when you're a CISO in front of the board, along with the evolutionary approach to addressing the landscape of data as it's evolving from just where we were on mainframes and firewalls to multiple clouds and the ability to control what that information is and knowing where it is and how to address keeping it protected. So sit back and relax and enjoy a conversation with the very first CISO, Steve Katz. So Steve, welcome to our podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, Looking forward to it. really appreciate it. So um, obviously you have the distinction of being the very first CISO and I wanted to get a sense of um, what you think has changed over the years in that role. Two things have changed dramatically. The technology has really gone through significant changes. Uh, the CISO role, when I went into it, all we had to do was worry about protecting mainframes and we had to worry about protecting departmental processors and then PCs and uh, came in and networking came in. And the philosophy was, gee, if you had a really strong uh, outside and a squishy inside, you're still going to be all right because you can keep uh, people out. Uh, technology is dramatically different. Uh, when we thought about distributed uh, technology and distributed data, back then it was which, da- which of our own data centers was the data going to reside in? Uh, today it is what data centers, which cloud or clouds, what other service providers. So the data is ubiquitous. It is all over the place. And the other is you had, you're sort of worried about end users working from their desktop. And today you have uh, work isn't uh, where you go, work is what you do. And that's anywhere. And you're looking at data information on, on your iPads and on your iPhones and uh, technology is open to any, anyone, anywhere, at any time, anywhere in the world. The other part that's changed, and it's, I find it curious because we, we tried to do things differently as city back in the 90s. So we, as in the 90s, we were sort of hoping we can get executives involved in security, get the board involved, and that took a heck of a lot of work. And we really worked hard to make that happen. And then always want to be careful what you wish for because you're going to get it. Uh, today, security is a board item. At one time, I guess it took GLBA to get the board to recognize that it was a CISO. Today, CISO is uh, ubiquitous in most companies, regardless of size. Uh, board is actively involved. Board asks lots of questions. Boards are making sure that risk is addressed and governed. And the boards require uh, the CISO to come in and present the state of security at least once a year, usually more often than that. And boards of directors have this horrible habit of listening to CNN or CNBC or Fox Business, and they hear about a hack, and the next thing you know it, 7 o'clock in the morning, you get a phone call from somebody in the board's risk committee or audit committee saying, tell me, that can't happen here, right? And we're covered, right? And it's back to trying to explain what you tried to do early on is that it's a risk issue, and here's where we are. What also has changed dramatically is that the successful CISOs back then were primarily successful technology guys. Today, if you want to be the truly successful CISO, uh, you really have to be the person who is going to develop credibility with business leadership and the board. And if you don't have that, you don't have anything. Kind of just something I've used in a, in a couple of podium talks is that uh, picture yourself as a CFO on an elevator, first floor. And CEO walks in and it's, hi, Bob, hi, Jerry, and they, they're talking and a few minutes, going, you know, the elevator ride progresses. They discuss the state, of, the financial state of the company. Same scenario. CISO is in the elevator. The CEO comes in. First thing the CISO wants to do is get off the elevator. More and more for not, they don't even recognize each other. They don't, they don't know each other. Which means the CISO just hasn't done his job in laying the groundwork and foundation for an effective business risk management program. 
So the biggest focus there is it's a business risk issue. You better, you need to and absolutely must develop credibility with business leadership, with the board. And you have to make sure when you see them, it is not only when there's a problem, you see them to let them know what is going on in the state of the world. So you talk about the landscape just dramatically increasing where we used to have data centers and now there's many clouds and the borders of the data is following where people and what they do versus what desktop they're working on. There's a phrase that you've used before that I've heard that really resonated with me, and it's know where your data is. Where did that come from? How did you how did you think of that? I came up very in a very curious way. There used to be a uh, tagline for one of the uh, tel- Manhattan television uh, stations, news station, saying, "It's ten o'clock. Do you do you know where your children are?" And that became an interesting tagline, especially since I was in a, a New York bank saying, "It is." End of quarter, it is end of month. Do you know where your data is? Matter of fact, do you even know what your data is? Do you know what's being done with it? Somebody um, came up with, and I wish I could take credit for it, that uh, there are two rules about data. First is data wants to be free. And second is it will reproduce. So if you don't know what and you don't know where, that data is going to go anywhere and everywhere. And if you don't take precautions early on, uh, some of the most, well, ask me, we can ask our friends at Equifax. You can ask, in fact, you know, you take a look at some of the other breaches. If you have not adequately understood where your data is, how it needs to be protected, what should be protected, and what data do you really not need? A friend of mine, an insurance company, has done an amazing, amazing job of eliminating social security numbers from every record that they have and having their major corporate clients do the same thing because they recognize that one will be sure where it was. And if you don't know where it is, make sure you don't have to worry about it because it's not there anymore. I love that it came from that. Com- I remember those commercials. Do you know, you know, it's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children mm-hmm. are? And I, I was a child when I watched them. But now, and I love the analogy, data wants to be free. My kids absolutely want to be free. So, you know, I love, and they better not replicate. That's all I got to say. <laughs> they be, that, 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 it, so, you know, it's, 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 yeah, it's, they're, they're way too young for that. So, um, Steve, I know you've played a, a critical role in the ISACs, um, and this is a, um, a, a major initiative that you've not only been involved in, but really believe in for both financial and healthcare. What have you seen evolve over time um, that's been pivotal to the ISAC sharing of information success? Uh, a little, have time for a little ancient history. In the 1980s, the data security officers, because that's what we were called then, uh, from the major banks, including the Fed, got together every two to three months for an informal meeting. And we'll just, we would just share information, share concerns. So when the, when PDD 63 came out and the uh, directive was to establish an ISAC, uh, I was fortunate enough to be called by the Secretary of Treasury to ask me to uh, help put together the Financial Services ISAC and be the Secretary Coordinator. I picked up the phone and called the other eight or nine New York City banks and saying, hey, look, we got this thing with ISAC, bop, 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 bop. We're not sure what it is, where it is. And this was like, late 1998. And uh, they said, look, we're in. Uh, Secretary of the Treasury arranged to have a meeting for us in the White House Conference Center, I guess, early April. And we had a couple couple hundred people there. But we knew, I knew there was a core of people I could count on unequivocally. And that was all the New York City banks and and brokerage firms. And then the other major FIs came in and the topic of ISACs came up and we said, look, we need this thing to sh- you know, share information. We need this thing to keep the sector you know, safe and we need to do it now because it's now April of 99 and 2001 is coming up. A two th- year 2000 is coming up. We really have to have something in place and can we commit to moving forward? And we went live on uh, October of uh, 99. Uh, Secretary of the Treasury had uh, public, you know, big public relations uh, gig going on. And what helped make it happen is there, was, there wasn't any money for it. There wasn't any funding. So the, new, the major banks got together and came up with $125,000 each and said, let's build this thing. And it was built on a level of trust that we had with each other. What has changed is that early on, the New York City banks were able to deal with each other as, and, as or a couple of other larger uh, banks. But it was difficult getting other FIs to share uh, breach information, to share breach concerns. And it took a while to, for folks to get confident enough to say, we need to be totally open, come with each other. 
because if something happens to any one of us, it's going to affect all of us, it's going to affect the entire sector. And that became even more crucial as data centers expanded, as uh, third-party utilization expanded, as uh, cloud expanded. So now there's a significant level of trust, uh, I guess, across, across the entire financial services sector. Uh, shortly thereafter, the uh, number of the other sectors started developing ISACs, and the, uh, we now have a very effective uh, national health ISAC that's doing quite well. The membership there is, well, not as great as the uh, financial sector. Moving forward at breakneck speed because there's a recognition that while well, financial data is important, health, uh, health data or compromised health data can cost, uh, you know, cause the loss of a life. So the sharing is there, the credibility is there, and the recognition that it is a huge world out there and a lot of really uh, smart bad guys can harvest data, sell it, compromise it. And uh, we need to make, you know, try to stay at least a half a step ahead. We're never getting a full step ahead. Yeah. And as a group, it's stronger together, right? It's, you know, even though you may have competition in the room, the reality is a big strategic issue. We need to come together to really solve it in a meaningful Interesting way. Interesting enough, the right? financial sector never, ever looked at this as a competitive issue. Yeah. And it's how do we keep this thing together? And that, that was tremendously rewarding. Yeah, that's great. So um, there are different sizes of companies, of course, small, medium, and large. And um, what we're looking at is in third-party risk governance or assessing third parties, sometimes it's a one-and-done approach. Can you talk to us about the evolution of continuous monitoring in that space? The term one-and-done is frightening. It is absolutely incredibly frightening. You wake up in the morning as a, as a healthy human being, uh, and the next day you have the flu. It's not one and done. Health on Tuesday doesn't mean you'll be healthy on Wednesday. It doesn't mean you'll be healthy on Thursday. It is, in looking at third parties, regardless of the size of the company that's looking, you have third-party companies offering services of every type uh, imaginable, whether it's data storage, whether it's processing, whether it's backing up, but the data is there. So we come back to one of our earlier questions. Do we know what the heck our data is? Do we know what it is? Do you know how important it is? But then we need a process to consistently look at third parties. Well, let me rephrase that. We have to consistently look at end parties. Because the, not necessarily the third parties, not difficult enough because companies have thousands of them, but you also have to look at the third parties that the third parties are using. And we just don't have the time and we also just don't have the frameworks necessarily to do that. So we have to wind up, stop trying to develop frameworks on our own for assessing third parties and finding the most effective or combination of the most effective third-party assessment tools that we can use, determine which of these third parties and, and get the triage situation, which ones we have to go out and physically visit, which ones can we send you know, a question to and have a, uh, a Skype review, and which ones can we just have uh, self-assessments done. But it has to be triage because we don't have enough time, money, or effort to spend you know, a lot of time with every company that we deal with. But we have to have some sort of consistent way of taking a first snapshot and then continually going back and saying, gee, are they still doing fine? Are they still doing okay? Or should, are there something going on that we really better start worrying about? And it, a one-time assessment, if that's what you can rely on, you're really going to be in trouble. You know, we, I want to go back to something that you were talking about earlier about relevance to the business. Um, you know, what does it mean in your mind for security's relevance to the business and really solving business problems? There are two things, and I have to attribute them both to uh, John Reed, who was the CEO of uh, Citicorp at the time. And the one question he was asked consistently, and which we've made a great conversation, is why do you have brakes on a car? You have brakes on a car so the car can go faster. So the brakes are enabling the car to do its job and perform better. The second is, and he was very good with it, he said, Citibank had uh, two products, money and trust. He said, if we can't sell the trust, we won't be able to sell the money. So our commitment is, consistently has been, what is our commitment to our, to our customer, whether it's a corporate customer or an or end consumer? They are trusting us with a significant amount of information, and it's regardless of sector. Uh, more critical in health sector, somewhat less critical in financial sector. But we have a commitment to maintain the security and safety of, of that information because if it's compromised, in some cases, people's lives, lives are compromised. In other cases, people's financial life is compromised. And if you've ever come across anybody who's had uh, 
uh, subject to a uh, identity compromise, and see what hoops they have to go through to just get their financial, their digital identity back. It's just frightening. It's overwhelming. When we look at businesses, we're saying, like, how can we really provide enough uh, security or, or protection in a product so that products can move forward pretty darn effectively? The, and it's got to be pretty, pretty seamless. Uh, you don't want it to, to impact the customer itself other than they're having a truly uh, you know, safe experience and storing data with you and making sure that their funds or their health records are available when they need it. I think the same is true potentially in healthcare, right? It's, you know, trust and people have to have a faith that not only when they come into a hospital, they're going to, you know, get treated from a health perspective, but that their data is going to be safe, that they're not going to have an issue where the lights are going to go out. They're going to, you know, it's going to, it's going to all go smoothly, right? It's funny you mentioned that because in financial services, uh, we always did look at security, we always did confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And I had the, I think it's pleasure of, being an interim CISO of one of the very large uh, healthcare uh, companies in the West Coast. And what we found is the CIA was reversed and it became availability, integrity, and confidentiality. Uh, if that data is not available, someone's going to die. So it, uh, yeah. very, much, very much there in health, healthcare and very much, and you, your focus also has to be very much on the availability and the integrity of the data. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's interesting. The triad's the same. The way you look at it is slightly different. Absolutely. Yeah, interesting. So, Steve, being the first CISO and now knowing all of the different intricacies of what's going on with the world, what, for the modern day time, does the CISO need to do and be and have skills in? Uh, first question, and I, I mentor a, lot, a significant number of CISOs. And the first question I ask any CISO wannabe is, why do you want to go do that? In many cases, these folks are technological experts. They have a safety net that they can take with them anywhere. And I said, gee, you are a, techno you're a wonderful technologist. You are brilliant in this field. Uh, no one can come, you know, come close to your skills. If you want to move into the CISO role, you're looking at more of an executive management role, leadership role. Uh, your technological skills will go from being expert to being proficient to being knowledgeable. So you're really cutting your safety net. And then you have to sit back and learn a whole new vocabulary, and that is you have to develop credibility with the board, develop credibility with business leadership, develop credibility in the company. And your role as CISO is almost being the CEO of a small company called CISO Incorporated. As a CEO, you are the outward-facing portion of that company. You are the evangelist. You're the public relations arm. You are the marketing arm. You have to be technologically knowledgeable. You have to work with technology uh, organizations, but you really need to develop a business risk focus. Uh, you need to be able to look at anything you're doing as how do you best enhance the business product or service that's being offered. And the other thing, which is kind of scary, but it's, it's, I've seen this happen in a number of big, uh, companies where I've mentioned CISOs. I've walked in and said, okay, why should your company have a security group? And you would think the answer is obvious. And you get a blank look. I said, if, if you don't know why, how could you make anyone else, how can you convince anyone else that there's a why? And then the other is, hey guys, how did your company generate revenue? How did it generate profit? What other products and services do you are offering? And invariably, they also get some very strange looks. And then they wonder why they're not getting the funding they want. They wonder why they're not getting the business cooperation they want when they really don't know what the heck their companies do to, you know, to generate revenue and earnings. So the CISO has got to make a commitment to really understanding the company he's with, what they do, why they do it, how they do it, who is important within the company, what is their background. One of the things I used to counsel my team about is when you, when you deal with an executive, with the business level executive, board level executive, they believe they are there because they're very, very bright. And in most cases, they really are extraordinarily bright. And when you go to explain something to them and go talk to them, if they don't understand what is being said, it is not because they're incapable of understanding it is. It is that you are too incompetent to explain it. Dr. Einstein had a wonderful quote. If you can't make it simple, you don't understand it. You don't will have to make it simple and understandable and let them know why it is important to them as a, as a business 
not why it's important to you as security, because that's irrelevant. The trust commitments are what really count, and the risk mitigation, risk acceptance are really important. And absolute credibility and honesty is important. Uh, when the, you get a call from a board member after they watched uh, Fox Business and said, this can't happen to us, you say, gee, John, I wish I could say that. It can, but here's what we're doing to mitigate the risk of that. Here's what we're doing. It's a risk management risk issue. Even in our own company, we see the same kind of thing happening, right? Really, if you can't explain what a function does in a business, whatever function, especially the technologist understanding what the business actually does, um, I, I, I wholly agree with that. And, you know, it's tough. We see that in our own company. We, last week, we got the whole company together. And certain people on the team, especially our technology team, didn't know how we sold our product. And it was really important to really make sure that they understood that so that they could please our customers and really understand how it works, you know? Um, so what advice would you give? You know, you said you mentor a lot of CISOs. What's the one piece of advice that you would say, you know, this is really what I want people to know as they're coming up? If it's not a passion with you, don't do it. It's, it's fun. It's, it's as simple as that. If you, when I was bringing people onto my team at City or, or mentoring people, it has to be exciting enough for you to sort of wake up at three o'clock in the morning and say, God, I've got the answer. It's got to be, the issues, the concerns have to just continually go through your head and recognize that you are going after something that is never going to be 100%, 100% complete. The technology is going to change. The expertise of the bad guys are going to change. The background of the bad guys are going to change. And the products and services to your company is going to change. Yeah. So it, you know, you can't remain stagnant. You've got to stay on top of it. It's a constant learning process. But you're also going to work with the smartest and most talented people in any area of, of, of a company and the most talented people in the sector itself. So it's so funny. This is almost identical. I'm, I'm reading a book uh, Eric Schmidt and team wrote about how Google works. Mm -hmm. And they talk, I, I literally just read this chapter last night, talks about being passionate and necess not necessarily, you, you don't necessarily have to say, oh, I'm passionate about this. It's really exactly what you're saying. You're, you're three in the morning, you wake up and you go, I know how to solve it. I, I got this. I'm going to, and it, you could, the work is part of your life mm -hmm. and it's really, it becomes integrated into the whole process. Yeah. I mean, you're part of something that's much bigger than you are yeah. and you're helping to move it forward. And it's just a tremendous challenge and so darn gratifying when you get it right. And so darn frustrating when you get it wrong. Yeah. But, and here's the interesting but, if you've done a really good job of developing credibility, providing honest, consistently honest answers, when, and be willing to go ahead and, if you believe you're right, have to go over your boss's head, you'll come out just fine. Uh, your job as a, as a CISO is knowing when to say, uh, making a recommendation and when to say I'm making a decision. And there are times when you have to make, when you make that decision, it, it can be painful. And you, you are potentially putting either a bonus or your job at risk. I had one situation in one of the companies I was with where they were about to launch a brand new product and they spent well over a year on it. And as they're getting really close to launch date and my boss is responsible for that point for launch date, I said, you can't go live. You're missing something. There's a hole in it. He says, yeah, but we've got everything set. The marketing set. I said, you can't go live. He said, I'm going live. I said, I'm going to the board. We didn't go live. But you have to be willing to bet your career and just do the right thing as often as you can. Yeah. And I, it, that's hard. That's super hard. But if you live with integrity and you do the right thing consistently, you have that credibility yep. to do that. Yeah, totally agree. So there are so many different industries out there. There's the auto, there's mortgage, there's financial, there's healthcare. And with regards to risk governance and the difference between or the similarities between risk governance and security monitoring, what with the world as it is today, what would your words of wisdom be? I would somehow change the CISO title to a CIRO title the chief information risk officer. And it's up to you to understand that as best as you can, here is the risk to, your, to the company as you see it. You were there as an advisor. One of the things that I did at City early on is we, when I walked into the job, they had a, a variance approval process. Admin walked in with a stack of about maybe 12 inches high of variances that I was supposed to approve. 
And I looked at it and said, mm, this doesn't make any sense. I said, I'm here is, I, I was too down from the, from the chairman. So I said, we're issuing a new policy for city. And that is, there will be a risk acceptance process. And at that time, with paper and pencil, it was, and we said, all right, it is a very simple paper form. One line, you know, what is, what is, you know, what is the policy that I want to bypass? Uh, what is the risk as I understand it? And how long will this be in effect? And it, the head of a business unit, which was fairly high at that time, had to sign off on it. The last line on the form was a line that said, going forward with this is against the recommendation of the CISO. Uh, two of the metrics I reported to the audit com- the risk committee was the number of risk acceptances by business units. So it set up a, amount of, a certain amount of competition between the business units. And the other was the number of risk acceptances that went against my recommendation. And in my years there, I never had one that went against my recommendation. Because before I would sign the bottom, I'd call the business head and say, Mary, do you really want to go ahead with this? This is a concern I have. And I can understand it. I make, I'm recommending that you don't. But I'm also, you know, indicating on the, on the form that it's against my recommendation. If you're putting the company at risk. And in my time there, there was certainly ex- risk acceptances and valid, but never one that went against my recommendation. Mid-year last year, I had the pleasure of sitting in a room with you, and I had in the past used the word exception to a control, and same thing as variance. And when you brought up the fact that, you know, it's an acceptance of a risk with either a compensating control or a date and a time where it will be completed, that was something that stuck with me. And I, I agree, we need to stop saying, we will give you a free pass. It's an acceptance, and this is what it's going to entail in order to be completed and or if you're going to accept it, it's the business that's accepting it. It's not the chief information risk officer or chief information security officer that's accepting it. Absolutely right. Businesses have risk. CISOs and CIROs, even CIOs don't have risk. And I think it's incredibly important that any of us who are in this field recognize that we we face the situation, there are times to get paid to make a decision and times to get paid to make a recommendation. Be damn well sure you know the difference. So I, th- I think the conversation so far, you know, if I look at the themes, have really been how do we really live within the context of the business? I, I think that's the right conversation, mm-hmm. whether that be security or risk. Um, how, how should somebody really talk when they when they really need to get in front of a board? This is a this is a new experience potentially for some of our listeners, right? A, a lot, this is the first time maybe people are really thinking in this context of having to talk to the business and the board. How how do you think people should should look at that? How do they do that effectively? Recognize you were there to make things you know understandable to the board. They're, they're, they're doing governance. They want to know that risks are being assessed and risks are being governed and managed. The first experience I had, and it taught me a wonderful, wonderful lesson, was way, way back in the early mid '80s. And uh, news, the world is suddenly becoming aware of these things called computer viruses. And I was very fortunate that, as we started to look at this, one of the very early antivirus companies, uh, their CEO and founder, came in to visit me, and he brought in his little five and a quarter disk, and we threw it on a couple of PCs and. Sure as heck, we found a couple of innocuous viruses, uh, enough to where letters on a screen would fall to the bottom and nothing serious, but the potential was there. So I went to the CIO and said, we really need to talk about computer viruses. We have an issue. And he said, tomorrow morning, can you meet me up at the boardroom? He says, I'm tied up now. Meet me here at about 10 o'clock and just let me know what, you, what, what this is all about. So the next morning, I get up. There's J.P. Morgan, so you've got to imagine the boardroom with J.P. Morgan, with a big picture of Morgan on, it, on, the, you know, on the wall. And he said, uh, uh, why, don't you, why don't you go and just let them know? You go. You go. Yeah. And it was like, holy blankety blank blank. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I walk in, and it's this, it's this amazing boardroom, and people don't know, don't want to know anything about computers or security. And so the discussion went, I said, you may have heard something on TV about computer viruses. There's a lot of concern about it. And I said, 
Somebody actually called me and said, can I catch it from the computer? And I said, no, you can't. I said, but try something. I'd like you to think about something because we had a big trading room. Picture she was sitting at a trading desk and fives become eights, sixes become nines, threes become zeros. Would that upset you? And you watch people think, can that really happen? Can you do anything about it? I said, I think we can reduce the risk. We can't eliminate it, but we can reduce it. Uh, I said, well, what do you need? And I said, about $400,000. They said, go do it. But the, the lesson there was, hey, you go to the board. And this I was caught, caught completely off guard. But you go to the board and you tell the story in a way that is understandable. These are people who want to do the right thing for a company. They're there for governance. And our job as security professionals is to make sure we, we let them know what the risks are that we're dealing with in terms that they're going to understand it. Is it something that will have a customer impact? Is it something that will have a reputational impact? Is it something that will have a bottom line impact? Clearly articulate, and, you know, and don't be condescending, but clearly articulate, here is the issue as we understand it. Here we have ways to mitigate it. We can drive the risk down. It'll never be to zero. Uh, and we will continue to monitor this for you. Is there any of are there any questions you have? But make sure this isn't the first time you've seen them. Yeah. Keep the conversation simple. Keep it to a story that can relate and then make mm-hmm. sure that they understand what, the, that what they're doing is the right. The right most system. famous, I, whether you, I don't care what Bible you want to look at or what uh, scripture you want to look at or what religion you want to look at. What has survived in terms of lessons framed in terms of stories. That's our job to frame it in terms of a story. And they'll remember it. Yeah. No, that's right. Now, Here's a question for you. So if somebody comes back 20 years from now and they've implanted computers in their head, will you say that they can't, can no longer get the virus from the computer? This is the question. It hasn't, hasn't been done already? I don't know. <laughs> have, have, do, we ha- do we have implants that are getting viruses? Well, I, guess, a, I guess this is the question. There's some great things there with nanotechnology, so I wouldn't... <laughs> yeah, I'm a little concerned. <laughs> little concerned. Next podcast. Yeah, this is... That's right. I think yeah. it, uh, the, the singularity is here. That's right. The singularity is definitely... Well, is it? Is it? Yeah. This is the question. Is it here? So this has been a fantastic podcast. So, Steve, we really appreciate you coming in and talking to our audience today. I think... Um, you know, when we look at the things that are really relevant in the community today, whether they were 1994 or 2018, the business is at the center of it all and making sure that we have relevance and we can help drive security and risk appropriately into the business, it seems like is the absolutely right message. Well, I just say is amen to that. Amen. Well, <laughs> we really, really appreciate you coming. Thanks so much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Prevalent Risk Governance Podcast. Connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and visit us at prevalent.net. You can also rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. 